All right, it's recording. So hi, everyone, welcome. Uh, so as you know, this is gonna be the Ask Me Anything for Phil, uh, and the topic is Web ID um, in specific. So um, I have a couple of questions to get us started, but please, there's a document in the event, so definitely jump over there and, and drop your questions as, as we go so that we can get as much as we can out of Phil's brain. <laughs> Uh, so I have my first one and I'm going to voice it uh, and then put it up in the document. So um, let's see if I can paste it. I might, I can I paste it. Right. So Phil, I wonder if you could give us a few examples of things you thought we should do with the web ID code base that we never got around to do yet. So stuff like with factors or stuff that were not exactly the, in the shape that you wanted, but uh, you thought we'll do it later, but we never got to. Uh, in the end, and feel free to share your your screen and, and show us around. But take it away. Um, I guess the biggest issue at the moment is performance. Like we're handling potentially hundreds, of thousands of files. The performance, I guess, could suffer a little bit. We did have web workers, um, but I think the delay between actually coming from the web worker back into the browser was making it look like the performance was bad, even though it technically wasn't. Like the browser didn't really crash, it was just there was like a delay, which there was gonna be coming back. Um this is probably the biggest thing we saw. Sort of, I've always wanted to tackle the performance of it. And I always, always wants to make it work offline. And it's just like there's so many complicated things into actually making the ID work offline that I like never really got to do it, or even tried to do it. And I did always bring up this is a, um, a JavaScript library that actually brings Git into the browser. I always wanted to look into using that instead of actually the API. Um, but I think that sort of creates even more problems, the fact that we'd have to clone. I guess for GitLab C, it's like a gigabyte big, isn't it? So I guess cloning a gigabyte into the browser is going to be very good. Yeah. yeah. They're probably the main things. They're, they're using the Git library, especially as always something I wanted to look into. I guess you could do a lot more stuff if we actually use Git in the browser rather than try and actually create our own version of Git. You might as well use someone else's own version of Git. Right. You know, on that bit of performance, uh, you talked about web workers. Do you want to you mention a little bit about why we introduced it and what are the web workers doing at this point? Yeah. I, oh, gosh. My screen just like go off. No, I, yeah, you're still on. So okay, that's okay. Um, so we did have web workers. I think they've been removed now. The main idea is the web workers because right as the best to explain this. So when we open up a, the ID, we request a list of files, and it's just a list of all the files, just a flat list of an array of strings that represent the path of a file. So on the front end, we then take that path, we chop it into like folders and stuff and generate that on the front end. And um, for smaller projects, it's not so bad. There's maybe like a couple hundred thousand that can happen quite quickly. It's when you sort of get into GitLab CE style projects that you start to notice and eventually the performance starts getting worse. So I moved that into a web worker. So again, yeah, like the performance still needs to be good in the web worker because you're still gonna get, it's still technically slow, which doesn't freeze the browser. Um, so yeah, that was moving to the web worker, which then does all the transform itself and then posts it back into the browser. Now the problem comes with the actual performance there is that because the web worker just passes across essentially just JSON, when it gets back into the browser, Vue then has to add its own reactivity sort of stuff to each of the objects and all the keys and stuff. So there's still a performance problem there. Um, I guess there's, there's still the delay coming back from the web worker, but it's not a massive issue. I think Paul maybe managed to get around it by sort of improving the algorithm a little bit and how we um, create the array of files. Again, it's, it's still eventually there's gonna be some project that has maybe like thousands of files that there's still gonna be the problem. I guess <laughs> if it works to see, it's okay. Hey, ask a question, a question now. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, do I understand right that the performance issue now is uh, technically, mm, 
uh, related to parsing all the data that comes back from web workers. Uh, is it the main problem? Yeah, well, at the moment we don't use web workers, it was removed. The right. main problem is the, because we need so much data per file <coughs> to actually run the web IDE, Vue needs to create watches for each of the keys in the object. And say each object has like a thousand, a hundred keys. You well, then start to go more and more per file. Technically, like removing data from the, from the file object is not a real option, right? Because we will eventually we will still be adding more data. So how do you, how do you see this as a solution? Like split the data into chunks, and for example, preload stuff that is like like first ten, and then lazy loading the remaining ones, you know, with fighter performance. Or like how 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 would you solve that? Um. Honestly, <laughs> this is like, it's not going to happen, but rewrite it in GraphQL. The problem is because we're using the REST APIs, we just take all that data that we returned and just think, okay, well, we might need it all eventually and we just show it in the object. Right. Maybe we don't need it all. Maybe we only need like a couple of keys from it. So maybe we could actually just check what keys we actually need. The problem comes is the fact that there's so much code to actually go through. Right. How do we determine that we've got all the data that we actually need? So, yeah, so yeah. But you think that um, switching to GraphQL might improve the things, right? But then again, we need to figure out what data actually we need. And yeah. it might turn out that we actually do need all that data. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, you're still back in the same problem. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so technically, like, um, uh, as, as, the, as the simplest solution, would, do you think that, for example, like getting, um, like, Parsing the data in chunks with lazy, uh, like lazy processing, uh, like files after, for example, the twentieth, would solve the thing, or it's like it's it's impossible to, due to some some technical things. Um, I guess there is like maybe could look into the components themselves and see how they actually render stuff. Well, we're not going to get around the memory problem. The more data we actually store on the front end, the more memory we're going to use. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, we could get a bit clever on how we actually render the components and look, okay, well that component's not used, but just lazy load that in and stuff like that. Okay, got it. So we, we on the source code part on, on the diffs, we did kind of tackle the similar problem where we're loading the whole diffs and we're loading them incrementally. And then we're just this, like the next step of doing sort of like a first request with GraphQL to get like a, just a list of the files so we, they can render the tree uh, in place uh, with the minimum metadata. And then we will fetch in chunks the, the full metadata that we, that we need um, in the future for whatever operations we need to do. Do you think such a similar approach would benefit this particular performance problem on large projects? I mean, we, 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 we could do that. So now if our GraphQL the endpoint that returns the list of files is fast, because it's just returning the strings. Um, but then it, is it useful to render that fast? Like, do I do the web ID? Do you want to open up and edit a file if we just render the tree, but you can't actually open a file? Is it any use? So yeah, that's, that's the thing that we have to figure out uh, exactly what use case were there. And, and then like, like Phil was saying about the removal of the web workers, that was done in the context of having the fastest bootstrap that we can have on web ID so that it could replace the uh, ACE editor, the old editor yeah. for the same file edit. So that was the most important thing is if you get a URL, then we need to load the file first and then the, the tree can be loaded like in this as a second class um, object. But it, like you said, there's so many use cases for the, for the web ID, but. Yeah, I mean, maybe if we start caching data in like local storage index DV. Yeah. Maybe that'd be better, but then still, you'd have to do it based off the commit hash. Um, if that changes a lot, then you're in no better position. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we, uh, Dennis, do you want to voice your point? Let me just check if anybody else. All right, uh, Dennis, do you want to voice your question, your, your, your next question? Real quick, yeah. can I get another point of clarification oh, before Justin. we move on? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I just, Phil, I just want to make sure I understood the problem as you stated it. It wasn't so much that you were pulling down a large chunk of data, but it is maintaining the watchers once you have them in memory? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so when we set up the actual file 
object, we add in the keys that we need, and then obviously eventually we request more data that adds into that object. I mean, the more keys in an object, the more watches view is going to add. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And like on their own, like on their own, they're super fast and there's nothing wrong with them. The problem is right. when you do more and more, if it takes like a millisecond per key, the more keys right. you have, the slower it's going to go. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's just a view internal. Okay. So there might be an avenue to investigate for um, statically rendering the chunk. So visually it looks okay for the user, but we're only watching the keys that we think they're going yeah. to interact with. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't know how you do that though, because I'm pretty sure you would just watch <laughs> all the keys. R right. Uh, you, you have to mess with how you have to write a custom renderer for the component itself yeah. where you're dumping just a static HTML and then your own custom sort of observation. Um, it's, yeah. it's, a sim it's a similar problem to like the rendering of video game where you don't render the entire world. You only render yeah. the thing the user can see. Um, I, I could say that in the abstract. I have no idea how we're going to do it in real life. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to make sure I understood it. But like, I mean, cool. if you could do it open source, then that'd be kind of a cool library to do soon. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Thanks, Phil. On to you, Dennis. That is one of the questions regarding performance, uh, or can we move on to Dennis's point? Yep. Um, Take it away. So, uh, yeah, we discussed this, um, uh, I think, last week or a couple of weeks ago uh, with Phil. Uh, technically, right now we have, uh, at, like, to my, to my preference, way too many arrays stored on the state with, uh, um, with different sorts of data. And the problem is that <clears throat> not always this data is reactively updated. So we have open files, we have state open files, state staged files, state changed files, state entries. Uh, the problem is that um, technically from, um, from architecture point of view, I think state entries have to be, has to be the single source of truth. Yeah. But uh, open files, staged files, changed files are uh, like separate entities at the moment and they get updated and they get uh, like get new items, get uh, items removed, and the problem is that uh, I've I faced this this issue with one of the deliverables when uh, when updating entries doesn't update all this or all those arrays. So I had this idea of like replacing all these open files, staged files, changed files with getters that would get computed once the state entries. Uh, get updated. So, but but you feel mentioned that you had some ideas in this regard. So I would like to 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 get those ideas if you don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> yeah, that give us. I I originally had this idea. Um, I might give it a quick go, and I probably didn't like the worst way possible. I just didn't like it at all. The probably the best way to do it would be to so state entries would be a flat object with keys of the actual file path or the folds path, and then. For example, open files, it would just hold a string that would then link to state.entries. Is that what, that's sort of what we were saying, wasn't it? Then you would have the compute the getter would be open files, which would then go look in state entries and generate the actual array of objects. Yeah, that that could be like uh, I, I I was thinking about like before I came to this getters things. Uh, technically, I thought that about getters as just the uh, sort of filtering of state entries. It might get slow though, but um, those things like open files, staged files, and changed files, uh, performance for those is not critical really. Like we don't need them to, to happen instantly. But I also thought about, uh, again, as well, like, keeping them as flat uh, flat arrays of just IDs of the objects from state entries. So whenever we need to retrieve an object, for example, like an open uh, file, we have the ID and we get, um, or like path, technically, right? Yeah. It's going to be path. And then uh, we would retrieve this from a state entries by the path. Uh, but, but again, I think like it's one step too many like if we would have open files, for example, get computed every time we update state entries, maybe maybe this 
this would work? What do you think? Like just just filtering of the of state entries, for example, somehow. Uh, Dennis, may I uh, jump in? Uh, I, when I first saw web idea, I had exactly the same idea, so I played with it like some time ago. And the problem is it git itself. I mean, uh, you can have the file simultaneously being staged and being modified, and this is different version of file. See, since we have like three steps, like previous uh, original version in git, staged version, and edited version, which is not yet staged. And uh, having this uh, in the single array is really troublesome because you still do not get a single source of truth. Uh, because uh, you have one file, uh, multiple entries for one file, just because one version of this entry is staged and why is one is not yet. But but uh, uh, for for every entry in state entries, I think every entry there has content and has raw content uh, parameters. So raw content contains the original data that has been like uh, from from like the last version stored in Git and the content is the current one, so technically the edited version. I think we do have this information stored on, in state entries, don't we? And, uh, and we have, in, in, in case we are going for, uh, sorry for jumping in, I've just played with this on some weekend, uh, and uh, if in yeah. that case we will have the third version we need to store, it's a staged version, because we, uh, they could be three different versions. Uh, you mean staged version can be different from modified version? How yeah, comes? exactly. How this is how Git works. So you can stage it. After that, you can change it. And uh, you, uh, in that case, you will uh, have a difference between staged version and uh, modified version. Yeah, we already, we already have, a, have an issue in this regard. Yeah, okay, <laughs> got it. Um, I mean, we could, still to we could still do it that way. So state entry should be a flat object with the keys is the path. Um, and then the open files, we just add in that path. Change files, we add in that path, just as a string that then looks up into state entries. But then when we want to move into staged, um, the staged array, we just move the actual object and copy it at that point. Uh, Phil, I have a different question. I'm totally unrelated to create team. <laughs> I'm from manage. Uh, I'm just uh, curious with up web idea and I dig into some of uh, the code. Uh, did you uh, consider it some time ago at the early start or maybe did you consider it right now taking some like uh, existing JavaScript Git implementation to maintain all the things? Yeah, so that was, uh, that was one of the first points that we raised. Um, yeah, the problem is for, for Git example, the ones that I looked at at least for um, GitLab CE, it's just gonna clone a ridiculous amount of files into the browser. No, obviously we do not want to have the full repository cloned into the memory, uh, but uh, I mean like maintaining the small copy uh, of this, so we will have, uh, uh, right now the code uh, replicates the JIT uh, storing model a lot, like with having staged files and so yeah. on and so on. So it's not like let's do direct push via the GitGS or whatever. Uh, but just uh, using the part of their code to replicate all this behavior, okay. which we are trying to emulate in Star. No, uh, so I never looked at just doing it for certain things. I was just thinking of using Git for the whole thing. But it'd be kind of interesting to use it just for the actual editing and staging of the files. That might be an interesting way to solve it. Ah, I see. But yeah, I was just looking at trying to clear the whole repository into the browser. Yeah, I've tried for, for my pet project that some time and it very quickly blows on the first binary file you meet. <laughs> yeah, earlier we were discussing this in the context of making WebID work offline, which was Phil's already one of the points earlier. But thanks for that, Ilya. Definitely useful for us. Um, if anybody has any other question? I have a couple. So, and where, Dennis, were you, were you oh, satisfied? Yeah, say that yeah I might have one more question. Uh, and as a question, I'm just curious because like I'm exploring the same opportunities for my same pay project. Uh, have you play, have you tried to look into the web assembly approach? Because uh, right now we are doing, uh, like I said, 
not uh, not emulating the entire uh, not cloning the entire repository but our uh, browser support in GitLab is pretty modern and uh, that uh, May in junction with index at DB even may help us to have some kind of offline work. Yeah, the only part of WebAssembly that I looked into is changing the syntax highlighting. At the moment, it uses kind of a rubbish version. There's a WebAssembly version that uses the C library to do the syntax hand. That is literally the only part of WebAssembly I've looked at. But it could be interesting. The problem then comes is how many of us could actually write the WebAssembly code we'd be using a library that I guess, I guess it wouldn't be so bad if we use a library. The problem is if we need to extend it in some way, is there anyone on the front end team that would be capable of doing that? Maybe there is. Well, our front end team is already need to be profit, uh, to be capable in Ruby. So one more, one less. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to hear from you, Ilya, because this, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm the only one here from the editor thing. <laughs> this means that this burden will, will be on me, man. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, no <laughs> Thank <offense>. you very <laughs> much. <laughs> so, thanks, thanks. Yeah, there's definitely more of us. There's Kai and me as well. <laughs> but I get your point. Um, so, I had one question, Phil. Uh, I wanted to see what you thought. And this is particularly interesting because at the moment we're, as you know, you're, we're considering Thea and other alternatives for the actual implementation of WebID. And I wonder, is there anything that in the past, when you were, I mean, you, you were right there from the start when you were working on the WebID. So the question is, what would you have done differently from the start when you started working on the WebID and anything related to Monaco, the way it integrates, any particular lessons there that you thought were useful? Good, I think so. I think the direction we took from the beginning was the right way. We started with this like multi parallel stuff that was a bit hacky, a bit buggy, a bit not great. Um, and then we moved it into the web ID. Monaco itself is fine, I think. In the browser, it's not going to be great anyway. Um, the thing that always interests me is so code sand I have some code sandbox that got BS code running in the browser for code sandbox. There was always something I thought we should maybe look at. It'd be kind of fun to have VS Code run inside of GitLab. The Monaco itself is fine. The performance is good. I think it's accessible. Pretty sure it is. Yeah, apart from uh, touch events and stuff, that was a bit hacky. Yeah. Well, yeah. VS Code would work with that, though, wouldn't it? Because I think Code Sandbox works on the iPad. So I'm pretty sure. I don't think they've done anything on top of it. Yeah, it is something specific to Monaco, I think. So on the third way, if we've got VS Code woman. But then I guess if I guess they uses VS Code, not Monaco, so maybe it'd be solved there as well. My problem with using Thea is that there's gonna be a Docker container running for every session at the web ID. Is that gonna be scalable? Well, I guess that's I, I that's what that Frank is looking into at the <laughs> moment. <laughs> Yeah, and there's, there's more changes that require that, but we're definitely taking it very seriously for the proof of concept and, to, and assessing all the work that is involved in, in getting that up to speed. But um, Kai's on the call and he's definitely, do you want to share about anything about that? But just to pick Phil's brain on that, Kai? I mean, I'm, I'm uh, here, I'll turn my camera on too. Uh, I'm more curious uh, about the, uh, I think the Docker concern is a very real concern. Uh, I think like implementation of running any of these IDEs that are uh, much more full featured than the current version of the web IDE, like have to, I mean, at some point you have to attach compute to them. That's why we've been spending uh, milestones and milestones trying to like attach to CI runners. And um, I guess in the way the web IDE works in some super hacky way that kind of just gets, gets there. <laughs> uh, it seems to be it's, it's legacy. So um, yeah, I'm curious, you know, like, if you think about that or if you think about like the architecture decisions that were made kind of historically and then um you know i think you're right like when it was implemented it was probably the right path given what it was trying to accomplish um but seeing where it's trying to go now like i mean would you rethink i mean i think looking at it from the lens of like where it's trying to go now would you rethink that or how would you deal with kind of those uh, other things or what do you think about those which is less yeah, fun I, guess, I, guess, I guess the direction is going to make sense for you Somebody's already created the IDA. I guess they make sense. I just I just worry that attaching Docker containers is not something I know. So it worries me a little bit. 
I mean, it might be fine. It's, it's from, it'll end up being okay and it'll end up being great. I just wonder if it could be achieved ourselves and try and run it. But then if someone's already done it, why don't you stay awake already if it's open source? Okay. Anybody have any comments on that? I'm going to ask a controversial question. So, Phil, what is the part of the web ID you feel is in worse shape in terms of code? Gosh. Um, I don't know. I've not looked at it in a while, so. You have to pick only one. No, actually, you can pick several. <laughs> I don't know. I've not looked at it in a while. I guess there's just so much code in there. It'd be nice to sort of chop it down a little bit. It'd run a bit nicer. I mean, it looks nice in the start of it. When it started, it was just this massive JavaScript object. We're all, every single bit of state was added into it. Um, the state was mutating compared into, it was mutating JavaScript files. It was like everywhere. We moved into Vuex, it sort of made sense. And then just as you start adding more features, it just naturally, the code gets a little out of shape. So just taking time just to make it look and feel a bit nice. I guess maybe run a bit nicer. So can I say play it all? <laughs> no, I mean, so I'm just trying to take a few ideas off of your head. Um, and one of the one of the things that I that I always felt we could have done better was testing the actual web ID uh, in terms of features. Was there any regrets there in your in your perspective? Yeah, we totally should have added more feature tests. But, I mean, the JavaScript code the majority of it is tested. We have a few end to end tests. It just tests that files can actually be committed and Heads did, I think, and I think there's one for image uploading as well. But it's, it's not enough. There needs to be more. Anybody has any other questions? That it's not just me and Dennis asking questions. I'm curious what the what the one feature uh, that product ignored you on or that you wanted to go build. Like, did we did we not go did we not go do? Oh, I don't know. There was nothing really that I'm, I came up with that would um, was something ignored on. I always wanted to get some time scheduled to get the um, the syntax highlighted and improved. There's a merge quest open, but it was just the test would fail, and I just didn't really get the time to actually go back and fix them. And it sort of it fixed kind of a lot of things that gave us view support. It improved the JavaScript syntax highlighting. I'm pretty sure it improved the Ruby highlighting. Yeah, getting that schedule would be nice. But then, if we if we start using Flia, I guess that does it, some nice code syntax highlighting anyway. So a lot of these problems will be solved. Yeah, else. yeah. Syntax highlighting is uh is brutal because it's I think natively Monaco only supports like a handful of things anyways. And like yeah, the, yeah. But there there is a, there's a um web assembly <coughs> library. The name escapes me. There's a merge custom way that actually does it, and that is the C library. Um. Yeah, I guess matching that to the current GitLab syntax has always been an issue because the GitLab code renderer uses Rouge, whereas Monaco doesn't, so the actual color differences don't match. We try to get them similar, but it's just, it's never going to match right. unless we use the C library. So, Phil, I, I don't have a question particularly written, but I'll just wing it. Um, so one of the things that we're looking into the future of the web IDE is uh, a possibility or possible scenario that we're going to have to re-implement the integration with GitLab using, you know, a plugin system, plugins architecture, using the sidebars, that sort of thing, tweaking the UI as much as possible as a plugin can do. Um, given that you worked on most of the basic initial integration there, um, do you have concerns on that approach? Is that something that we could pull off just using the, the sidebars that you use for the for the pipelines and, and, and the, the web terminal, that sort of thing. Is that something that you think is achievable or do you have any concerns? Yeah, that? it's totally achievable. The public API is kind of good. We use it for pretty much all of it anyway. Right. I don't think there's any issues there. Yeah, like some, of the, some of the endpoints work at GraphQL as well, so using them would be nice. Yeah, well, what was the trickiest implementation? Like of all of the um, workflow integrations we had, what, was, what would you say was the trickiest? I didn't think we really had any tricky ones. The API already existed. Like 
it's it wasn't something that was new. The API to commit multiple, multiple files that already existed. So we were just hooking into that. It was not really any complicated. Like the easiest of them all was integrating with Code Sandbox. It was just like five lines of code, maybe. Then we had JavaScript projects running in the browser. Wow. And I'd like to understand how it works. I have no idea how Code Sandbox works. I've spoke to Alex so many times. And he tries to explain it, and I have no idea on how it works. He's just a genius kid. Um, so uh, can you talk a little bit more about that collaboration, uh, especially about integrating a third-party um, work tool thing from outside into the GitHub world? What was the lesson? What, what should we have done differently, especially about collaborating with someone who's not full-time working for us? And sometimes we get blocked <laughs> internally. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we had a lot of time when we were doing it. We always had calls with them every week. So at that point, it would have been nice to actually discuss these problems that we had but because they weren't scheduled. We didn't really come up with the problems that we do now of hosting it ourselves. Um, so I guess because we're not booking them every week, it's not a priority for them. So you're saying that having weekly calls would benefit? The we used to with Ives, but I think because, I mean, I don't know how the contract with Ives is doing. I can't really comment on that, but I guess the contract ran out with him or maybe something like that. And we just stopped having these weekly calls. Yeah, I think we originally paid him for yeah. work. And now it's kind of like a, please help us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on that subject, is that like a, is that something like if, if say the IDE changes entirely right to VIA or some other VS code based, um, <clears throat> IDE is like that a is that an integration or a or a feature that you see like staying or having to be rebuilt or like I mean writing a more full featured IDE with compute in theory like that could run differently I guess right because we're yeah I guess the compute side of things is only way to be better for the back end side of things that you run the actual app for JavaScript projects it can just be run in the browser pre code sandbox. Do we need to talk to a Docker container to actually run the JavaScript? I don't think so. It can run in the browser, run stuff like a Rails app. That makes sense in the back end. Run something like Nux where it needs the server running. That makes sense. And I think that's how Code Sandbox do it now. So the actual front end code it runs in the client. And um, for the server, they just push out to a docking container maybe. So it'd be similar to that, I reckon. Yeah, the question is whether the tool that we pick up does that out of the box or we need to we'll figure it out. Figure it out and, and well, the tool it. that we used would work for client-side JavaScript. We need to build the backend stuff ourselves. So well, I, I didn't get that, Phil. Can you? Yeah, did... so the, the code the library we use is called Smooshpack or Sandpack, or something like that. And that can compile the front-end client code in the browser, but it doesn't handle any back-end stuff, which, I mean, it wouldn't need to. So we'd need to build that ourselves. Yeah, from, but from this point on, I mean, it, it would be doable to integrate that ourselves. The question that I have is probably there's a plugin already for VS Code uh, to do that or use that, so we can probably benefit from that. Um, and if not, we can just write it as a plugin. Yeah. I mean, the code to actually integrate it is like super easy. It just needs to create this new class and then it just, it just asks for the files that it needs. So every time it sees an import, it'll just ask us, Hey, listen, can I just have this index.js file and we can get the content to it. But it's not complicated. It sounds it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, questions, more questions. We have a bit, a bit more time. I think I've run out of questions I had prepared. <laughs> no? I'm trying to think. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask one because we, I remember um, we'll kick this around a little bit about preparing the web ID to be run as an embedded 
application somewhere else. Um, we talked about embedding it in 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 other places. I can remember what what was the use case in specific. Were you involved in these discussions, Phil, at all? Nope. Oh, okay. there was some discussion maybe about having like personal projects. Yeah, and then yeah. I think it was like so that you could take a snippet, put it in some web page, and have the web ID boot up directly from from that. So, given the current arch architecture, I mean that of course is impossible. But um, so uh, since you weren't involved, I'm asking this out of the blue. But um, do you feel like making the web ID a standalone app um, itself, to, so that it could be embedded wherever? whether through an iframe or something like that is something pushing too much? Uh, was it, would it be doable? What would be the, your concerns there? Okay. Um, I don't know. I guess it, the current way, it's, it's just not going to work at the current code. It have to be rewritten. Um, right. I think when I, so Tim originally moved onto its own route. So it was at gitlab.com slash ID or whatever it is, um, and the idea that eventually we would have like personal um, projects. So you could, instead of not being projects, to be like our own like personal area, or I guess like snippets sort of where you could just write code and save it. Um, that never came about. So it seems a bit weird that we have this like stupid URL. It'd be nice if it was just github.com slash org slash ca slash ID. That'd be nicer. But it'd be kind of crazy. Like I, I read someone, someone saying, "Well, could we embed the ID in issues?" And that's just that's just so crazy. Like it's just like so much JavaScript to load. Yeah, it would just be kind of scary. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think we got around that with the uh, code suggestions and stuff like that on merge requests, where you can just like embed those suggestions there. But not for the issues themselves. I, I I can I could see some some benefits of having something like that for um, educational purposes or um, articles where you have full code pen kind of UI, but it's actual web IDE running, and it's a completely different use case because there wouldn't be much integration with GitLab, or or if they would, there would probably be a messy login workflow. But um, I, I'm I'm yeah, I think we'll probably get around that with snippets and then we can probably like embeddable snippets and then we can just have the snippets be more interactive and, and inherit some of the web ID features. No, that'd be cooler. Like code pen, but GitLab. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. So all right, I'll put that on the shop shopping list and then get that <laughs> financed. <laughs> no, but but definitely uh there's a lot of use cases that we considered. Um so one, of course, the use case for, for the, the main use case for the web ID is just like you want to do a quick change, you don't check out the code, but there's a lot of other use cases that we can definitely benefit from from those advanced features, um, but not really specific that I want to pick your brain on at this point. Um, questions, everyone. Dennis, is there any concern on your uh, mind about the future that we haven't covered yet? No, the future is bright. Awesome. This, I love this guy. <laughs> um, At least it has to be. <laughs> we can we can write it down and make it. We'll make it bright. Yeah, let's let's make it an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that yeah, I get that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything in particular. Um, so we cover tests. Um, I mean, we don't we don't have to to extend this on purpose just just to make the time and then he will be around for for a couple more days yet. So we can definitely, if we need to, just reach out to him or or, or me and we can hop on a call and record that as well and make that available. Um, so if you think about anything else that you haven't asked here and you thought, ah, oh, I should have asked Phil, uh, there's still a couple of days to do that. Um, so Phil, do you want to? Is, was there anything on your mind regarding the history of the web IDE that we didn't touch? Uh, anything you find relevant? I don't think so. I guess, does everyone understand the history of the IDE? Does everyone know where it came from? We could definitely use a, a two minute version because okay, I. Gosh, two minutes. I, oh, no. I mean, we have 
19 minute schedule. So <laughs> you can use that. That's like about 20 minutes, so you can, maybe? You can use three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it will be it will be interesting how it came about and who picked it up first, and how you came along and you took it on uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. So the original project star stuff is this multi file edge thing. Um, a guy called Jacob Schatz, he was originally content manager lead person. It was his sort of idea to allow people to edit multiple files in the browser without actually having to clone the project. He found that quite a lot. Of, it was mainly for people who weren't that tech savvy. They didn't really know how to get clear and stuff like that and create commit. It was nice that they could just go into the browser, they could edit multiple files, they could commit them, and you didn't have to worry about anything. Um, so it starts off as this multi-file editor. The code, it was done in a month. There was, the merge request was huge. There were so many comments on it. It was like impossible. I'm pretty sure you can't even load the page right now. Um, yeah, it was kind of buggy, but it worked. And it sort of showed that it was possible to do. And that quite a lot of people sort of found the project interesting. I don't think at that point it got picked up by any project manager. It was still just Jacob's little thing. And then I sort of came in and decided, okay, well, I'll just rewrite all the way the status mice into the UX. Um, we all changed some of the design. And I think at that point, eventually, the product manager picked it up and it became the IDE. Or it was named the IDE, at least. Because um, originally it was going to take over the file listing. It was all just going to be the file list and there wouldn't be like this separate route to edit. You just click a file, it would load. You could change it there. You could commit it. Um, yeah, so then the project managed to go. We got some designers into it. Previously, it was just Jacob and one of the designers on the side just coming up with some design and what it should look like. Um, so once the designers and the project managers came in, we started getting the time schedule to it. It started to look a bit nicer. It started to work a bit nicer. Eventually became one to its separate route. At some point in all of this, it was decided that it would be an E only feature. So for like maybe a release or two, it was moved into the E code. Um, and that was eventually decided to be moved back into CE. I mean, it kind of made my stats look good because my stats went from like added like 100,000 or whatever, like 10,000 lines into E, and then it went back into like added 10,000 lines into C. So it made like my contribution graph go kind of good, which I was okay with that. Um, it's not a competition, but yeah, I get it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you look at things, I probably shouldn't say this because it's a competitor, but GitHub give nice stats on who adds how many lines into files and stuff. So it makes my stats look kind of as like plus 200,000 maybe lines of code. And it's thanks to moving the ID from C into E, back in from E to C. Um, yeah, so it came in this ID. The, at that current point, you could only have changed files there was no such thing as staged files so i think it was maybe dimitri who came with the idea that we could have these staged files so we started to stage the files it was kind of easy to do because you can just clone the object into a different array and it would be it would keep the safe at that point um yeah and i think that gets us to where we are now we've got code sandbox the terminal the terminal was something we always wanted to do and we had designs way back when it was just the multi-file editor obviously, because we had no back-end engineers assigned to it. There was no way we could get it working on the front-end early. Yeah, yeah. Now we have the nice well, idea. Well, was, was Monaco there from the start, or was that something we... Yeah, Monaco is the, the OG. It's the OG. <laughs> it's lasted for a long while. You know, I, it was yeah. Amazing. Pushing it all directions. And, and yeah. Very but well. Monaco itself, it can get kind of out of hand. Every time you give it a file... So in order to boot up the, the Monaco ads, you give it a file and pretty the content, and I'm pretty sure you give it a path. And based on that path, it will work out the actual syntax highlighting based on the file extension. Um, but every time you pass this, Monaco creates a new model in itself and was holding that in storage. Um, so even if you opened and closed the file, it would create a new model for that same file. So we ended up creating this model manager type thing that would cache it on our side and we could just pass it into Monaco if we would open the file. So yeah, Monaco's been there since the original day one. Awesome. Thanks for the trip down memory lane. Um, so, okay. That brings us back to our question before this. Anybody has any other questions?
Okay, I think that basically does it. Um, so again, I'll repeat, if you have any questions, reach out. Uh, Phil's last day is gonna be July 31st. So definitely uh, reach out to him until then. If you need to hop on a call to record it um, so that we can capture those conversations, uh, I, can, I can get that set up. Um, and for those that are interested on the topics of source code, we'll be having one other, uh, well, one of these uh, next Tuesday. Uh, it's in the calendars, uh, front end and the source code as well uh, group. So feel free to come by and uh, I'll make this recording available to everyone, um, hopefully on YouTube. Right. Thanks very much, Phil, for um, allowing us to pick your brain and to drain all your thoughts. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks. Have a great day. Man.